Hello, uh, thank you so much for having me. And first I want to thank Professor Mason Case for the invitation. I was really sorry that I couldn't be there in person, um, but hopefully we'll be able to have an interesting conversation, um, at least remotely for now. So my name is Linda Collins. I'm a professor with the Center for Environmental Law and Global Sustainability at the University of Ottawa. And my specialty, in addition to toxic torts, is the area of environmental human rights. So I've been researching and publishing in this area since about 2006. And during that time, the field has really exploded. Um, at the time, there were very few people actually writing about this topic, and it really wasn't being taught in law school. So I'm thrilled that you are covering this at Osgood, my alma mater. Um, and it's a great opportunity to contribute a little bit to your class. So what I want to do this morning, or this morning when I'm recording this, um, is to give you really an A to Z of environmental rights. So I want to talk to you about environmental rights at the international and domestic levels and the various categories or iterations of those rights. So the form that they take and crucially, the impact that they have. So I have written that we can broadly categorize environmental rights um, into three groups. Uh, and these are specifically environmental human rights. We'll talk a little bit later, if time permits, about rights of nature. So the rights of the environment itself. But in the area of environmental human rights, we can usefully break those up into these three groups. Procedural environmental rights, substantive right to help the environment, and the idea of the environmental deprivation of existing rights. So procedural environmental rights are exactly what they sound like. This deals with the rights that people have to participate in their own environmental governance. And procedural environmental rights include at least three kinds of rights. Um, the right of access to information, the right to participate in environmental decision making, and the right of access to justice. So in other words, the right to challenge government decision making on environmental matters in courts. So internationally, I would say this is the most strongly established category of environmental human rights. Um, there is a broad-based consensus among the nations of the world on questions of access to justice, public participation, both generally and in the environmental context specifically. So we have some binding treaty law on this internationally, the Aarhus Convention in Europe, and the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean have just concluded a treaty on environmental procedural rights. Hasn't yet been ratified, but we expect that it will. Um, this is a new development in 2018. But even apart from that treaty law, we are seeing a convergence in the practice of countries around the world. Um, so, you know, the presence of environmental assessment statutes, which are all about generating and disseminating information about environmentally significant projects. These are very widespread throughout the world. Access to information statutes on a more general level and obviously access to the courts being you know, a key pillar of democracy and rule of law everywhere around the world where, where those things exist. Um, in Canada, Procedural environmental rights are also the most firmly established and the most well-developed. So we have in all the provinces and at the federal level, general access to information legislation. It functions um, to varying degrees in different jurisdictions. So the Ontario statute is quite effective and includes rights of appeal and has been used very effectively by environmental NGOs, uh, notably EcoJustice Canada, which as you know, has a clinic here, uh, or you may know, has a clinic at the University of Ottawa and has an office in Toronto where you guys are. So NGOs have been able to very successfully use 
access information at the provincial level in Ontario. The federal statute is not as strong, uh, but you know I have seen activists and even students of mine use it quite effectively. I had a student who in fact was able to um, obtain federal military records regarding the spraying of Agent Orange um, historically. So it certainly can work. So access to information, very well established. Public participation in environmental decision making. Again, we have at all the provincial levels and federally environmental assessment statutes, which do allow for varying degrees of public participation, including even in some cases, you know, live submissions and hearing type environments. Um, and there's many other forms, uh, avenues for public participation in environmental decision making in Canada. So for example, um, in Ontario, we have rights under the uh, Environmental Bill of Rights, which I know you'll be talking about, which can allow people to in fact challenge government decisions before the Environmental Review Tribunal. There's a whole separate land use planning scheme. And again, people have the right to appear before the Ontario Municipal Board. And then obviously on that third category of procedural environmental rights, access to justice, you know, that's functioning very effectively on the whole. Um, certainly scholars have argued we need to broaden the notion of public interest standing, um, particularly in environmental cases, but you know, Canadians have effective access to the courts to challenge uh, environmental decision making and the recent federal court decision regarding Trans Mountain is a great example of that. We do have the ability to um, override government decision making through access to the courts. So that was the first category, uh, procedural environmental rights. The second category is known as the substantive or freestanding or independent right to a healthy environment. And this is actually at the opposite end of the spectrum um, in terms of its status, both in international and domestic Canadian law. So, uh, you know, I have argued and many have argued that the independent right to a healthy environment uh, is a norm of customary international law. That's probably a somewhat ambitious claim, but it gets more and more viable every year. Um, so the right to a healthy environment, as you may already know, has been incorporated into the domestic constitutions of the vast majority of the countries of the world, and particularly those that have updated their constitution um, in the last 30 years or so. The formulation of how that right is described varies. So we see the right to a safe environment, uh, the right to a clean environment, the right to a healthy and ecologically balanced environment. Um, and I would say that over the past 10 years, certainly scholars anyway, uh, and activists have converged around this formulation of the right to a healthy environment. Um, and I've tried to make the argument that that can be interpreted quite broadly uh, in the sense that healthy could mean healthful for humans. In other words, healthy air, healthy water, you know, the type of environment that is conducive to human health. But it could also refer to the health of the environment itself. So we could say, well, you know, people have a right to access healthy forests healthy lakes, you know, ecosystems that are thriving and functioning well. So the right to a healthy environment can be interpreted um, fairly broadly. Now internationally, uh, so beyond domestic law, the right really first makes an appearance with the Stockholm Declaration of 1972, which explicitly says that humans, as so men, um, has the right to live in a healthy environment. Um, interestingly, since Stockholm, actually the most, I would say, significant developments have really been happening at the domestic level. So after Stockholm, we started to see the surge in nations adopting that norm in their own domestic constitution. At the international level itself, 
Um, it has made it into some regional human rights treaties. So the Protocol of San Salvador and the Inter-American System, for example, um, and soft law declarations, and perhaps most interestingly, uh, a few years ago, the United Nations appointed a special rapporteur on human rights and the environment. Um, and the first special rapporteur was Professor John Knox, who's an American. And Professor Knox spent years traveling around the globe, interviewing experts and activists, and has produced a series of reports um, which really flesh out this concept of the right to a healthy environment. What does it mean and what obligations does it imply if this right in fact exists? Now, very excitingly, um, as Professor Knox's term came to an end, the UN appointed a Canadian, Professor David Boyd, as the next special rapporteur. Um, and Professor Boyd famously wrote a book called The Environmental Rights Revolution, which is really the pivotal work in this field. He's a very uh, ambitious and forward-thinking scholar, and so I think we can expect good things um, from this mandate. And Boyd has called on the United Nations to draft and encourage countries to ratify a treaty explicitly recognizing the right to a healthy environment as an aspect of international human rights law. Um, now I should say there are some other areas of international law that uh, are relevant to the right to a healthy environment. In particular, um, the right to water uh, under the International Covenant on Social, Economic, and Cultural Rights um, and Indigenous Rights. So the right to water has been interpreted by the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights uh, as an aspect of the right to uh, an adequate standard of living. It can also be viewed as an aspect of the right to health. Um, but that committee has really focused attention on the right to water and, in fact, has fleshed out what the right to water means. So, you know, quantity, quality, pricing, all of those really important details. And uh, through the efforts of the activist community and various nations who are interested in this, they were able also to get the United Nations General Assembly to pass a resolution recognizing water and sanitation as a human right. So that uh, particular aspect of the right to a healthy environment is uh, more clearly uh, recognized at the international level. Then we have indigenous rights and um, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples has a number of provisions, many provisions that would potentially overlap with the right to a healthy environment. Um, and it also includes, interestingly, sort of rights of environmental self-government. So the idea that indigenous peoples not only enjoy the right to have state governments protect their traditional territories, but in fact that indigenous peoples have the right to manage their own lands and waters to effectuate this right. Uh, now, an interesting question, which I maybe should have talked about right off the bat, is what does the right to a healthy environment mean? And I'm going to talk in one moment about uh, the third category, where we recognize environmental deprivations of existing rights. Um, but before I get to that, I would just say that the right to a healthy environment encompasses all of the existing recognized rights, so the right to life, the right to security of the person, the right to equality, the right to an adequate standard of living, the right to health, the right to what they call privacy and family life in some jurisdictions. Wherever those rights uh, interact with an environmental intrusion, the right to a healthy environment would encompass those rights, but it also goes beyond those rights. Um, and this is really important uh, in a number of areas. So how does the right to all the environment go beyond existing rights? How does it help us? What does it add to the right to life, for example? Well, the right to life is really only going to protect you from uh, the most serious 
environmental problems. So typically where we have seen the right to life mobilized in environmental issues are pollution cases and they're the worst pollution cases. You know, So if you can show, as was done in India, that air pollution is killing you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people every year, the right to life can be used um, to require government to take action, which is what happened in India in the, in the famous Delhi buses case. But, you know, many environmental problems are more subtle. Uh, even human health effects might be chronic, cumulative. And so the right to a healthy environment has been understood to include the precautionary principle. And as you may already know, the precautionary principle is fairly simple to articulate, can be very difficult to apply, but it's basically the principle of better safe than sorry. Um, in other words, we shouldn't wait for full scientific certainty before taking precautionary action to regulate uh, for environmental health. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that um, in a moment, but the precautionary principle is part of the unique content of the substantive, freestanding, independent right to a healthy environment. Um, another unique aspect of this right is the protection of aesthetic interests. And this was identified by Professor Dinah Shelton, who's really one of the giants in this field, um, back in the 90s, I believe. And she argued that the right to a healthy environment does include people's sort of spiritual or sensual or aesthetic connection to the environment. So she said, you know, even if we couldn't show uh, an impact on human health, the right to a healthy environment would in fact prevent a beautiful forest from being turned into a moonscape. That there's a sort of intangible connection between people and their environments that is encompassed by the freestanding right to a healthy environment and would probably uh, escape scrutiny under the other existing rights. So the right to a healthy environment includes the precautionary principle, it includes protection of aesthetic interests, it also crucially includes the doctrine of intergenerational equity. And I don't know if this is something that you've come across before, but again, this is actually quite a straightforward um, and in many ways very intuitive concept, something that I think most of us can relate to. Uh, this doctrine was most definitively articulated by Professor Edith Brown Weiss in her 1989 book, uh, In Fairness to Future Generations. And Weiss posits that the present generation of humans are both beneficiaries and trustees of a planetary trust. So her idea is that, in fact, as currently living humans, we uh, have obligations to future generations yet unborn. So, in other words, past generations passed on to us a livable planet that allows many of us to meet our needs. And our obligation is to preserve and, in fact, improve uh, planetary conditions for future generations. I'll just insert here that um, Weiss also argues that this doctrine includes an intragenerational obligation. In other words, she argues that the present generation also owes obligations to each other to access the planetary trust. So in other words, uh, intergenerational equity encompasses poverty eradication now. Um, the idea being that everyone living now has an equal right to access the planetary trust um, in order to meet their needs. So this is not about sacrificing the very urgent needs of the developing world or indeed indigenous communities in the developed world. Um, it's not about sacrificing those interests to the future. Um, it's about creating environmental justice today, but also tomorrow. So this is a very important distinction between 
the substantive right to a healthy environment, and what they call the existing rights approach. Because all of the rights that have currently been recognized at international and domestic levels only apply to presently existing humans. So the right to life is the right to life of people who are alive now. Same with security of the person and liberty, freedom of religion, all of those rights. And so there's this huge hole in international human rights law. Um, and you know this is where we see a, a real divergence between human rights law and environmental law. Because as you well know, you know, environmental law has for a long time been focused on the idea of sustainability, which is an inherently future-focused idea. So environmental law is very much concerned with preserving a healthy, vibrant environment indefinitely into the future, whereas human rights law has been really limited in its time horizon. It's really looking at people that are alive now. And you can't achieve environmental sustainability uh, working within that limitation. And crucially, you can't protect the environmental rights of future generations working within that limitation. So that's a really important, um, unique aspect of the freestanding right to a healthy environment. So finally, we've talked about the first category, procedural environmental rights. The second category, the freestanding right to a healthy environment. The third category um, has been phrased differently by different scholars. So some people uh, talk about this category as being the recognition of green elements of existing rights or even the greening of existing rights. Um, my view is it makes a lot more sense to think about this in terms of environmental violations of existing rights. Uh, and, you know, I think I came to this approach uh, because I did start my career as a litigator and I still, you know, tend to think as an advocate. And what I have noticed over the years um, when appearing before courts is that in general, judges are quite cautious people. Um, they're quite conservative people. And it's better if you're not asking them to recognize something brand new. So rather than going into court and saying, you know, take everything you know about the right to life and add this new thing, add this new area of content. Instead of saying that, I think it's going to be more effective to say, leave the right to life exactly as you have always conceptualized it. We're just asking you to recognize that the government could violate that right to life through environmental conduct. And in particular, I've used the concept of serious state-sponsored environmental harm. So what I think uh, we need to be doing and, and what some litigants indeed are doing it's just arguing that serious state-sponsored environmental harm can violate all of the existing rights um, that have been recognized at the international level and domestically in Canada. Now, internationally, this is a well-recognized concept, um, and we have seen international human rights tribunals at the international and regional levels repeatedly recognize this. So, so this is a concept that is very well accepted now. When I began researching in this area in 2005, I couldn't say that. But now, 13 years later, yes, we have international consensus that serious state-sponsored environmental harm can and does violate all kinds of recognized rights. Um, and internationally, we've seen uh, tribunals and domestic courts recognize environmental deprivations of the right to life, uh, health, the right to privacy and family life, the right to property in the inter-American context. And as I mentioned, one of the most famous cases comes out of India and involves uh, air pollution. And the court in that case said, yes, the air pollution in Delhi violates the right to life and actually ordered the government to convert its entire fleet of buses to natural gas. Uh, away from diesel into natural gas. And that's a really exciting example. Um, there are many others, but I love that one because uh, air pollution is something that has been very well studied by the scientific community. 
So we could actually quantify the number of lives that have been saved as a result of that Indian judgment. Now, what's happening in Canada with this? Well, up until recently, I would say the answer is not much. Um, there are a number of cases over the past 20 years where this type of argument has been made. And obviously in the Canadian context, um, we're primarily looking at three sections. Most important, I mean, I think that the section that has the greatest chance of success is section seven. So life, liberty, and security of the person. Uh, however, there are also viable claims for sure under section 15, the equality provision. Um, and that's because we have unequal environmental protection. I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, and then finally, actually the first environmental charter claim to reach the Supreme Court of Canada dealt with Section 2A, uh, freedom of religion. So those are our three, you know, for now anyway, these are the, the three sections that I think are very likely um, to come into an exchange with this whole idea of environmental human rights, 7, 15, and 2A. A number of cases were brought under Section 7 in the past, uh, dealing with a variety of things, sour gas wells in Alberta, um, there were challenges to municipal fluoridation of drinking water, there was a challenge to the siting of a landfill, and uh, the long and the short of it is the, all of those cases were dismissed on either procedural or evidentiary grounds. Um, there's an excellent summary of those cases uh, at the back of David Boyd's uh, second book on environmental human rights, which is specifically Canadian, um, and it's called The Right to a Healthy Environment. Um, but the important thing about those cases is that although none of them were successful, in several instances, courts accepted that serious state-sponsored environmental harm could violate the Charter. So the cases really left the door open um, to this kind of a finding. Several years ago, EcoJustice brought a claim that I thought was a probably going to be the one to establish environmental human rights under the Charter. And that was uh, representing several members of the Amjanong First Nation in Sarnia. And again, I'm not sure if you've already studied Amjanong, uh, but Amjanong is really an example of regulatory failure in Canadian environmental law. Um, Amjanong is a pollution hotspot near Sarnia. So this First Nations community uh, is living their lives in the shadow of Canada's chemical valley with very significant pollution of air, water, and soils, and uh, very significant levels of illness that are disproportionate compared to the rest of the province. Um, it became most famous, as you may know, uh, when it was discovered that the gender birth ratio had become skewed. So normally you have one baby boy for one baby girl. Um, that community started to notice that they needed two girls softball teams uh, and only one boy softball teams. And when scientific researchers came in, they did find that the the gender ratio of births had become skewed two girls to one boy. It's the only community in the world where that kind of skewing has been documented. And uh, the causation of it is very complex, but actually it makes a lot of sense because the community is being exposed to a lot of hormone disruptors. Uh, and we know that the chemicals that they're being exposed to uh, can affect babies in utero. So obviously it is somehow interfering with the hormonal processes um, that create boy babies. This is probably more info than you need to know, but actually all embryos start out female. And then there's hormonal processes that turn um, embryos with the XY uh, into males. And obviously somehow these hormone disruptors are interfering with that process. So the Anjanong community, because it's such a severe example of environmental pollution, um, was an excellent place to start in trying to get the attention of Canadian courts and, and get them to engage in this idea of environmental violations of the Charter. Long story short, that case was voluntarily discontinued um, when the province of Ontario brought in stronger and better 
air pollution standards. So, you know, it was a missed opportunity to create new law, but ultimately there was a very good result for that community, um, which is really what we're about as environmental advocates. So that's Anjanong. It was definitely the one that most of us thought was going to establish this principle. However, there is another um, case working its way through the courts, also involving the First Nations community. And now I'm saying that's the one that I think is going to establish this principle. And this is the case of Grassy Narrows. Um, some of you may already be familiar with it, but Grassy Narrows is an indigenous community um, north of Kenora, Ontario, right on that boundary between Ontario and Manitoba. And through a whole variety of government action and inaction, the people of Grassy Narrows have been exposed to mercury contamination uh, for decades. And this takes us to the definition of serious state-sponsored um, environmental harm. So that can happen when government actively does something like operating a power plant or sewage treatment plant. Um, it can be where a government issues permits to private industry, specifically saying, yes, you can operate that pulp and paper mill, you can discharge these contaminants into this river, whatever. And it can happen through non-enforcement. So you have pollution standards, you have you know, mercury emission standards, and general prohibitions on environmental harm in your legislation, but you don't enforce them. Um, Non-enforcement was the norm in Ontario for many years. That's one of the things that EcoJustice learned through its Freedom of Information request. So we were seeing like 90% non-enforcement of known environmental infractions um, for years. And in Grassy Narrows, there's really a combination of uh, those kinds of harms. So we had government affirmatively permitting, so, you know, issuing written permits that said, yes, you can do this, a variety of polluting industries, and we had non-enforcement and a failure to remediate. So, you know, years after the government knew, and in fact, the international community knew that Grassy Narrows was highly contaminated with mercury, um, the government was still not cleaning up. In fact, it was only, I think, last year that the province has committed to, you know, multi-million dollar investment to clean up Grassy Narrows. Um, like Amjanong, unfortunately, became famous internationally. Researchers would come from all around the world to study mercury poisoning because it was so prevalent and so serious um, in that community. So that case is working its way up. Excellent counsel, so Rick Lindgren from the Canadian Environmental Law Association, very, very experienced uh, and competent counsel, and very strong facts. Um, the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario in her recent report, Good Choices, Bad Choices, you know, just absolutely exposes uh, the government's role in this mercury contamination. She also does a great job of discussing Amjana. But, you know, it's sort of one of those cases where we can't really fight about whether this has happened and how severe it is because the data is so strong. So I think we are going to see a finding there of violations of two sections. So section seven and also section 15. Um, the violation of section seven I think is very clear. There is certainly a risk to life and security of the person and, and maybe it's worth just underlining that a serious risk to those rights uh, constitutes a violation of Section 7. Uh, the Supreme Court of Canada has made that clear in a number of cases. And that's quite important in environmental matters because there is often some degree of scientific uncertainty. So you don't have to prove that the pollution killed people. You only have to prove that it poses a serious risk to life and health. The other aspect of Section 7 that, in fact, is somewhat unique to Canada um, compared to other countries around the world is that our guarantee of security of the person includes protection from serious state-imposed psychological harm. So this was an argument that was made in Amjanam, I think very effectively, um, by EcoJustice, 
that, you know, if, even if the court didn't accept that this government permitted pollution posed a serious threat to physical health, it was pretty hard to deny that it was causing serious harm to psychological health. Uh, because the people of Amdenong, you know, were constantly worrying <coughs> about the safety of, you know, the, the basic means of life, air, water, soils. You know, they were subject to emergency drills, um, accidents where they would be told, stay inside, tape your doors and windows shut. So it, was a very, it is a very, very stressful community um, in which to live. And the argument was made that, in fact, that violates security of the person. Um, section 15, equality. So this comes to uh, a general point that I think most lay people don't appreciate, and even many lawyers who aren't familiar with environmental law don't appreciate. And, and that is that uh, there is very uneven environmental protection in Canada. So the level of protection that you get depends a lot on who you are and where you live. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that environmental law in Canada has not effectively dealt with cumulative impacts. So what we have uh, in Ontario, for example, we have regulations that set limits on the concentrations of contaminants that you can have in air or water emissions. So it will say, you know, you can only have X parts per billion of sulfur dioxide in your air emissions, you know, measured over a 24 hour period, whatever. Uh, and so you can only get a permit for that level of emission, but there's no cap on the total number of those permits that can be issued. So the government can issue one such permit to one facility to emit that, those many parts per billion of sulfur dioxide, or they can issue a thousand. And obviously this is like a nonsensical way to regulate for environmental protection because the body doesn't care that the concentration levels are being respected at each source. You know, the body cares about the total levels in the air that I'm breathing. And because we don't effectively regulate cumulative emissions, you end up with what they call pollution hotspots. So some communities bear a much greater burden of pollution than others. So, you know, the ministry is not issuing a thousand air pollution permits in Rosedale, but it is issuing many, many, many pollution permits in Amgenau. The other real hole in um, our air pollution regulation in particular, which the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario highlighted, is it is possible for industry to get an exemption, even from those, you know, not entirely effective concentration limits. So this is what has happened in Sarnia, is the companies have said, you know, look, we really can't meet the normal standard for benzene. Benzene is one of the worst pollutants there is. Everybody agrees. Very seriously harmful. Um, industry has said we can't do it. Like we'll, we'll have to shut down. So the government gave them an exemption that says you only have to meet this technical standard, which basically means do the best you can within reasonable economic constraints. In other words, while still making a profit, for your petrochemical executives and shareholders, try to limit benzene emissions. But the number that they've come up with is not even attempting to protect human health. Nobody says it's trying to protect human health. It's not a health-based standard. It's a technical standard, meaning this is the best we can do technically while still making a lot of money. So, you know, tragically, essentially it amounts to explicitly sacrificing the health of one community um, in order to maximize the economic interests. You could say of the province as a whole, but obviously these are for-profit companies. So, you know, really, if we're being completely honest, it's really about enriching um, a small segment of the province as a whole. Now, they do employ people, and that's important. Uh, but, of course, what we know from years of environmental economics research is that 
we can create just as many jobs and even more jobs by doing things in a non-toxic or less toxic way. So you know, job, the job security is really not an argument against health-based environmental standards. But all of that spiel is just going to the question of Section 15 or environmental equality. Um, and as you know, when there is unequal protection of the law on uh, an enumerated or analogous ground under Section 15, so if you're getting less environmental protection because of your race, gender, age, disability, whatever, then we have a violation of Section 15 and the burden shifts to the government to try to justify. I didn't talk about Section 1 when we did Section 7 because actually it's very difficult to justify violations of Section 7 because um, as you may recall, in order to show a violation of Section 7, there has to be a deprivation of the right and it has to not be in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. And once you've shown that, it's very difficult then for the government to prevail under Section 1. Um, in environmental cases, um, principles of fundamental justice that might apply would be, for example, arbitrariness. So you've got a statute that says no one shall discharge a contaminant that may cause an adverse effect. That's the purpose of the statute. That's the court charging provision of the statute. But then you issue a regulation that allows them to you know, emit very high levels of benzene, which we know is going to make people sick. So we can say, well, that's a deprivation of security of the person and, and life, and it's arbitrary because, in fact, it goes against the stated purpose of the statute. Um, so that's why I didn't go into Section 1. Once you've shown um, a, a deprivation inconsistent with the P's of FJ, you're usually going to be fine under Section 1. Section 15, you know, can be different. Um, it doesn't have that internal justification test. And so Section 1 becomes very relevant. But again, you know, I think in any of these cases, uh, and sadly there are many, dealing with historically marginalized indigenous communities that are really being subjected to a heavy-duty pollution load that uh, non-indigenous Canadians on the whole are not, I think it's going to be difficult for government to justify that um, under Section 1. So we've talked about Section 7, we've talked about Section 15, briefly uh, 2A. I just want to talk about freedom of religion. You may already have covered the Tanaha case um, in other classes, so I will be brief. But Tanaha is another indigenous community, this time out in BC. Uh, this is not a pollution case, this is a development case. So the Tanaha Nation um, holds sacred uh, a certain area in Jumbo Mountain, which they refer to as Khatmuk. And there are protocols, indigenous laws essentially, governing uh, how that territory can be used. And one of those laws says you can't have permanent overnight human habitation. So a developer applied to the BC government to build a 6,000 bed ski resort in Khatmuk. And the Tanaha challenged uh, the constitutionality of the approval that was granted, both under Section 35 and under Section 2A. Now there are many cases finding that environmental harm, state-sponsored environmental harm, can violate Section 35 rights. So the right to hunt, fish and trap, um, the right to conduct ceremonial uh, rituals, uh, and also Aboriginal title itself. Um, the real problem with Section 35, of course, is that the justifi justificatory test developed by the courts um, very often allows violations of 35 to survive as long as there has been consultation. So even if the consultation involved the government saying, you know, how do you feel about this project? The First Nation says, absolutely not, no, no, no. The government goes ahead. They can cure the Section 35 violation by the fact that they have engaged in consultation. Now, the consultation requirement is getting more robust. We saw a very robust interpretation of it in the federal court's decision in Trans Mountain, and I'm optimistic that that jurisprudence can get stronger. But to this point, um, it has really been weakened by that consultation loophole. The Tanaha argue Section 35, um, they have a claim of Aboriginal title, they certainly have Aboriginal rights, but they also argue 2A. So they say, look, our freedom of religion is violated by desecrating 
this sacred site. Um, you know, this is like our church. This is like our cathedral, our synagogue, our mosque. And it's really not possible for us to enjoy our freedom of religion if you destroy this area that is the home of the grizzly bear spirit on which we rely, you know, ancestors, current generations, and future. Very disappointing, um, and I would say regressive judgment on that from the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, you know, they say that freedom of religion is not even engaged. So, you know, I think most of us thought that the big fight would be under Section 1, but actually, they don't even recognize that destroying an indigenous sacred site implicates Section 2A. So I don't want to dwell on it too much because I do think it's sort of a last gasp of a very colonialist approach to um, our relationship with indigenous peoples. I really genuinely expect the jurisprudence in that area to get better you definitely saw just a lack of cross-cultural understanding and really a deep fear of uh, what the court refers to as indigenous veto powers. Um, and it's very interesting because internationally, you know, the idea of an indigenous veto is known as free prior and informed consent, and it's viewed as a good thing <laughs> that, in fact, you know, there should be a veto in the traditional territories of indigenous peoples. Um, but certainly it was a missed opportunity. It was a missed opportunity doctrinally, but probably more important, it was a missed opportunity for reconciliation because even had the court found that the violation could be sustained under Section 1, they had an opportunity to show respect for the Tanaha's conceptualization of their religious relationship to land, um, and the opportunity was missed. Stay tuned. I expect to see more cases like that. There are um, a number of cases making similar arguments around the world, um, and notably in New Zealand, those indigenous freedom of religion cases have been successful in many instances um, and have caused courts to quash government permits for a whole variety of developments in order to respect Maori freedom of religion. So um, in the three minutes, I don't want to go the full hour because I'm not actually there, so I'm not taking questions. In the three minutes that I have remaining, I just want to briefly say environmental rights are now in the process of evolving beyond anthropocentric rights. And there's a very robust rights of nature movement around the world. And this is the idea that the environment itself or aspects of the environment enjoy legal personality and rights. Um, you may have noted in the news that Several natural features in New Zealand have been granted legal personhood by statute. So river, an area that was formerly a national park, they're now being co-managed by committees of government and Maori representatives, but they're seen as legal people themselves. Um, and courts in India have recognized uh, the river Ganges and certain animal species as legal persons. Now, this might sound strange to you, uh, but as Boyd points out in his most recent book, Rights of Nature, actually the law has recognized legal personhood of non-humans for a very long time, most notably the personhood of corporations. And in many ways, uh, recognizing the personhood of corporations while failing to recognize the personhood of nature has created sort of an insoluble structural problem. In a contest between one entity that has legal personhood and legal rights and another that doesn't, the one that doesn't is always going to lose. So this is, you know, sort of the cutting edge. Um, Bolivia and Ecuador have recognized through either statutory or constitutional provisions rights of nature. They have specifically said um, you know, in particular using the language of their indigenous people, that nature or Pachamama has the right to exist, to thrive, and to be restored. And we've even seen cases of courts enforcing that right. Um, in a case called Wheeler in Ecuador, there was some illegal mining going on. It was brought to the attention of the courts. The courts found that it was a violation of the rights of nature. And in fact, the government um, sent military there and blew up the mining equipment. <laughs> So 
um, perhaps a strong response, but just to make the point that indeed rights of nature are enforceable by the courts. Um, it's not sort of so far out that we can't conceptualize it or work with it. They, they can work in real life. So that is my A to Z of environmental rights, environmental rights of human, environmental rights of nature, internationally, domestically, past, present, and future. If any of you have any questions, please do feel free to shoot me an email. I'm easy to find online. Um, my name is Linda L-Y-N-D-A of Collins. It'll be easy to find my email that way, and I'd be happy to um, respond to any of you by email or even have a phone conversation if it's something that you've really taken a particular interest in. So thanks again very much, and 